Welcome to Psych for Psychology, a Nystrom nice and Associates podcast. Our host, Brett Cushing, is a licensed marriage and family therapist at Nystrom. Each week, he talks about all things mental health and therapy with guests, and you get a chance to dive into specific psychology topics that help promote personal development and wellness. And now, your host, Brett. Welcome to another podcast of Psyched for Psychology. We're so glad to have you with us. I am with Krista Overson again. Hello. (laughs) We are delighted to have her here. We're going to be talking about worry, and we're going to differentiate worry and ruminating, something that is, I would say, part of the human condition. Absolutely. We do this. We do it a lot. And so we're going to be talking about this and how do we, what is it? What's the difference between the two? Why do we do it? How do we overcome it? Mm -hmm. So highly practical because we all do this. And dare I say we do it on a daily basis? I would say so. Yeah. I think it's probably sort of a habit for a lot of us, myself included, where I don't even realize I'm doing it right away. Well, it's funny you say that because I remember I read this and I've heard a couple of people say this as well. Hard to believe, and who who does this study? I don't know, but they <laughs> they counted and figured out how many thoughts and conversations we have a day. Ooh, yes, had you yes. heard about that at all? Maybe, probably. Okay, yeah, so I think I, I know where you're going. Yeah, I've heard that we have about seventy to eighty thousand thoughts, conversations within our head every day. Wow, and women have more than men, is what I've heard. Okay, <laughs> I have no Not idea. To brag. Yeah. I, <laughs> Yeah, well, there's yeah, there's both sides of that. Yep, so, yep, yep. Uh, but it's it just is what it is. And now, what's fascinating is seventy seven percent, something like that. Mm-hmm. The vast majority of those conversations are negative. Yes. Okay. Yes. And of those negative ones, you know, let's say it's fifty five thousand. Do the math or whatever. Sure. Fifty five thousand. Ninety percent of those are just recycled over and over and over okay again kind of saying the same things to ourselves wow over and over again now i've done the math actually i really have i nice. just was really interested I love that. nice uh, i think it was with a client and i was talking about this and i said so for 20 years you've been doing this oh my gosh 55,000 negative thoughts mostly regurgitated let's take that by 365 days times 20 years uh-huh. and like look at this you have been Wow. Doing this, this so it's going to take time, you know. Yes. Because millions and millions and millions of times you've been doing this without even realizing it, yeah. and that sort of helps people realize, oh wow, okay, yeah, it's it's understandable that I'm not going to change yeah. quickly. However, uh, it does mean that there's hope. I, I can change this, which is what we're going to be talking about next time too. Is that yeah, idea? Yeah, good call. Neuroplasticity. How's that for a little? I love it. Intro? A little plug for the yeah, next one. Yeah, exactly. So really fascinating. Now, when we think about worry and ruminating, mm-hmm. how much of that takes up our headspace, our time? Mm-hmm. So, what are your thoughts? Tell me, like, well, what so, are you thinking? First of all, it, it kind of blew my mind um, just now when you said that. What percentage of it was regurgitated thoughts? I about, hadn't heard about that. About 77%. Whoa. Okay. That's super helpful because I had heard the part about majority of our thoughts and conversations in our head are negative. So that's just on its own a big thing. But then the fact that a huge percentage of them are also regurgitated, that makes so much sense about why rumination is a thing, right? And why we might feel anxious or we might feel stressed because our mind or our brain is like constantly rehashing the stuff. So right. I decided, I actually went and looked up, I, I was curious about the, the origin of this word, because I was like, rumination, like, I don't really know what that means. So, it's a little gross. Cool, we <laughs> like know, gross, right? yeah. Exactly. So, basically, it comes from a Latin word, um, ruminari, which in turn derives from that, rumen. That clears everything up. Yeah. I know, you're welcome. <laughs> <laughs> um, but so, basically, I didn't know this, but so, ruminant animals... Um, did you know that, that like a cow is a ruminant animal, meaning they have several stomachs and they have to like chew their cud and it's this whole thing with digestion. And I was like, okay, what does this have to do with anything? (laughs) But what it gave me an image of, which is actually helpful is just that image of like, you're kind of chewing on something over and over, you know, how a cow like chews on its cud, the mind or the brain is kind of like chewing on different things that have happened. 
So that helped me because I was like, okay, that makes way more sense. Mm. Um, Sounds delicious. I know. Uh, yummy. <laughs> nonetheless, it really reinforces exactly yes. those thoughts that we have over right. and over and over again. Right, right. And, and yeah, it's it, it really paints a picture too, I think, of yep. is this really effective? Who wants to be chewing on the same food oh, yeah. over and over? Well, right. Over Most people again. hear that and they're like, oh, that's kind of like gross and maybe not helpful. And so I think the same goes for rumination. Not that it's like disgusting, but that it's not really something a lot of us probably want to be doing. And it's also maybe not the most productive use of our time and energy. Right? Right. I know nothing about nutrition as my eating habits would (laughs) indicate. However, I would think like when you are eating and chewing on food, the nutrients after a certain point in time uh, yes. got to be gone so what totally. what is the purpose of continually chewing food if the nutrients yep. have yep. been absorbed already there's there's just futility right. so right. i was just thinking about that and yeah. obviously how it relates mm-hmm. to the effectiveness of mm-hmm. ruminating and worrying right well, so and another thing a, di- a differentiation you had mentioned earlier was um when we were talking about rumination was it's more to do with the past is that right right versus the future Yeah, thanks for bringing that up because that is really the hallmark difference between anxiety and rumination because Mm -hmm. anxiety is about the future. Mm -hmm. Ruminating is more about the past. We ruminate about something in the past. We get anxious and worry about something in the future. Mm -hmm. And so Mm -hmm. the way I talk about it with clients is that time travel is real. Yes. Because I mean, yes. we don't get into a DeLorean and take off somewhere. Into, only. <laughs> yeah, that would be so cool. And yet, we do that we do. with our thoughts. Yep. And with those worrisome thoughts, those anxious thoughts, mm-hmm. we go into the future and we yep. go into the land of the what ifs. Yes. What if this happens? What if that happens? What if this happens? Yep. And it was fascinating because I had a number of my clients when COVID first struck, Ooh. you know, we were all like, oh, no, what does this mean? Very understandably panicked. And, mm-hmm. and I found a number of my clients who were always anticipating some sort of thing in the future to come. Yeah. They were actually kind of relaxed, almost like, whoa, see, yeah, it's finally come. You know, <laughs> and, like, I was right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. I told you. <laughs> And I did. I, and I talked to a number of them about that. Like, yeah, yeah. You know, kinda, yeah so we no. do try to anticipate, but we do go into the future, yes. into the land of the what ifs. And what if this happens? And what if that happens? And what if this doesn't happen? Mm-hmm. And then ruminating, we do time travel into the past, right. into the land of the woulda, coulda, shoulda. Yeah. And now we have all sorts of depression, regret, mm-hmm. things like that. When yep. we are, and then we're going over it, like you're saying, over and over and yes. over again. So right. I think those are uh, really just key distinctions between worry and ruminating. Totally. Well, then I was thinking, okay, so so what are the things that people would typically ruminate about, right? Because I, I was trying to think of, okay, for myself, I mean, for me, it's like things like a conversation I've had. You know, especially if it's with someone that maybe I don't know very well or it was a first impression. I'm kind of like, okay, gosh, what did they think of me? (laughs) Right. Or with a boss. Or or, or the boss. Right. Yeah. Like just someone where I wanted to have a good impression or, and I'm kind of like, okay, how did that really go? Did I, or you make a joke. Do you ever make a joke and it just like kind of falls flat? I've never, (laughs) actually, no, my jokes are always funny. (laughs) Because at least know. I'm laughing. I know. Same. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> but sometimes I thought like this one's a sure thing and then it just flops and I'm like, oh my gosh, you know, later on I'm like, oh, why did I have to say that? And so right. that, that was one thing I thought of. I think people also might ruminate about like problems that don't seem to have a solution. Like, mm-hmm. um, like a situation that you're going through where you're like, gosh, I just don't really, you're feeling stuck. You don't really know um, what to do about it. Not, not like a future one, but like. For me, it's like, okay, this, this, and this has been going on at work, um, and I don't really know how to get through it, so I'm right. just like, I'm just like perseverating on it, right? Like, Absolutely. over and over again. So, yeah. Do you have any- Yeah, I, I really relate to that yeah. uh, personally, and Good, yeah. some of the research I've come across, too, indicate that when we start to worry or we start to ruminate yep. into the future or into the past... Mm-hmm. One of the reasons we're doing it is our body kind of goes on this high alert status. Like, ooh, oh. wow, hey, there's a threat. You yep. know, kind yep. of kind of like a car alarm. You sure. know, pay attention. Yep. 
Yep. And it's not bad. I notice how we tend to think ruminating is always bad. Oh, good Worry point. is always wrong. And yeah, like don't my do it. <laughs> favorite points is like that all or nothing thinking yeah, not. doesn't help. Yep. So we tend to judge that and yeah, attach all this pejorative language to our mm-hmm. ruminating and worry. It's not all bad because mm-hmm. our our body is kind of getting ready for something. You know, sure. with the ruminating, it's oh no, I feel vulnerable. Mm. And with the the anxiety and the worry for the future, we feel vulnerable too. And sure. sometimes we are. Maybe we did say something that was, oh man, I can't believe I put my foot in my mouth again. Mm-hmm. What do I do about that? So yeah. yep. it helps us uh, because it gives us energy to be able to do something corrective. Mm-hmm. And I love what you're saying and really implying, I can't do some things. I can't Mm -hmm. come up with an answer. Right. And it's kind of like doing, remember the Rubik's Cube? Yes. Uh, Did you ever finish one? Never. Yeah, I I, I just (laughs) gave up. Not even close. (laughs) But imagine trying to do a Rubik's Cube and it's such that there's no answer. There's exactly. no way to ever do it. And yep. and that's, I think, what anxiety is. And that's what ruminating is. It's yes. going over and over and over again, trying to come up with a solution, yep. which is what we do. Yep. We're trying to come up with solutions. And yet, yep. I, I can't. I, there, there's no answer because yep. what I'm worrying about in the future, what I'm ruminating about in the past, mm-hmm. there is no answer. There is no solution. But mm-hmm. but I know what I can do. Yes. I can just keep trying. Ah. And that's what we do, isn't it? With yes. worry and with ruminating. We just keep trying anyway. Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. Kind mm-hmm. of back to that chewing on something over and over again. <laughs> right. Like, I'll just chew this again. Yes. See how it goes, right? Um, actually, that that made me think of um, kind of a shameless plug for therapy, actually, because I think people sometimes have the impression that therapy is just like, oh, I'm just going to talk about your feelings, you know, like, yes. and it can be a misunderstanding because a lot of times it might have nothing to do with your feelings in a given session or mm. with a given therapist. It might be more like I've been thinking about this issue and this problem for so long on my own. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I am so stuck because I haven't been able to say it out loud to another person necessarily it might be something that i don't feel comfortable sharing with others in my life right mm-hmm. and i need to just have someone really listen and kind of break it down with me digest it if that, you will right. right and see what we can figure out so that so i just wanted to throw that out there because therapy is not always about your feelings it's a lot of times about i'm stuck i've been having this issue i need to talk it through and the other person helps you kind of take it apart did you hear that men <laughs> Because I know, all right, I'm being it's stereotypical, not, but yeah, men, we're not true. conditioned to know what our feelings are, nor care, nor right. find relevance what other people's feelings are. Why? Right. Because men are actually conditioned to problem solve. solve. And yep. Yep. so I, I, I like what you're saying, too, because this normalizes mm-hmm. therapy. Yes. This is to have worry, to have yep. ruminating behaviors, to have anxiety. Yep. That's normal. Uh, yes. In fact, the, the vast majority of people will have some anxiety generalized or some particular kind of anxiety, for instance, yep. in their lifetime. Right. And right. we kind of look at emotions because that's what's sometimes the most evident. We yes. don't. Yep. We don't know what we're feeling, but we have even less idea what we're thinking. Exactly. So we go into therapy and we... It's sort of like, okay, let's see. Notice this alarm is going off here. This alarm we call anxiety. Let's back that up. Yep. Because that comes from a thought. Mm -hmm. And I I love what you're pointing out. The thoughts that we ruminate on over and over again about the past or that we Mm -hmm. worry about for the future. These are things we just are continually trying to find an answer for. Exactly. We're trying to fix it. We're trying to fix it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Yep. And so, yeah, I just, that's a, I think a common misconception about therapy is that it's, yeah, emotion, emotions based or that it's like, oh, you have to get in touch with your feelings. It's like, yes, there is definitely a component of that, but it is a lot of practical, like, let's just look at this. Let's put everything out on the table and just see what we have going on here. Yeah. So kind of like a puzzle. Kind of like, it is like a puzzle. It is. I know a lot of times I'm thinking, I don't know where these pieces go. And, and so I appreciate you saying that just to normalize that this happens and that's what therapy is. Yep. And I'm sure people are listening and thinking, okay, well, how do I know if I'm really ruminating? How do I know yeah. if I'm worrying too much? If it's normal, when mm-hmm. does it become mm-hmm. a problem? Good point. So I think one of the things that would differentiate rumination 
from just like you know constructive or like beneficial processing yeah. would be if you're feeling a lot of um, self blame, if you're feeling a lot of guilt or shame. You know, those are kind of maybe some signals that you're dealing with rumination, um, such as and you're and you're not you're not having solutions. You're not having like insights. It's more like, okay, I'm either I'm the problem or the situation's the problem. It's just very, I think it feels a lot more negative than Mm -hmm. like a constructive thought process. Is that fair? Yes. Yes. It is. It is destructive rather than constructive. Right. Right. And we, we know this basically Mm -hmm. what I'm hearing you say is on the basis of our emotions and how much we're experiencing emotions Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and emotions I think we talked about this in podcast. I'm sure we talked about it sometime. <laughs> uh, e motion. Think about the letter E yes. in emotion. Maybe yep. you've heard this is like energy in motion. Yes. And so then we put these labels on, like it's good or it's bad. No, it's so it's true. just energy yeah. in motion, and it can motivate us to do what we need to do. The difficulty is that I have yep. this emotion. I have this energy. Mm-hmm. That's ready to be in motion to solve a problem yes. that can't be solved. Good point. And now I have other emotions of yep. regret and shame. Like I should be able to figure this out or I, sh- I shouldn't be ruminating or yep. I shouldn't be worrying. Yep, totally. And actually that makes me think too of specifically if you've been through any sort of trauma, I think that's where rumination can kind of get into that self-blame. Because one of the things that can happen in a traumatic event is the person might take away, this was my fault. Mm. You know, I'm the, I'm to blame. I'm the cause. And again, it could be going back years. It could be more recent, but just Mm -hmm. kind of the rumination trauma can really sometimes fuel rumination. I I'm kind of jumping up here. I'm so excited you brought that up because when you talk about that with trauma, we tend to blame ourselves. Mm -hmm. And why is it related to worry, anxiety and ruminating Mm-hmm. Because it's all about control. Yes. Remember, we can't control the mm-hmm. outcome of what happened in this case with ruminating about past abuse. Exactly. And But we're looking for some answer. Mm-hmm. And so I heard this from uh, years ago from a guy who was sexually abused. And he mm-hmm. said, the reason we do this yeah. is because what's scarier yeah. to think that what happened to me, I caused it. Mm-hmm. Or to think what happened to me was something completely out of my control. Yes. Actually, it's totally, it's scarier to think it was completely out of my control, right? right? So we protect ourselves by trying to come up with a solution and we ruminate on that. And then we keep coming back to that solution that it was my fault when we want to make it explicit. Yep. It was not your fault that this abuse happened to you. It's the person who committed it is culpable and responsible for it. Right. But yet we do this because we don't like, who likes to be out of control? Who likes to feel vulnerable? Absolutely. Like that. Yes. No, that is such a great point, actually. I think that's one of the ways that we adapt to it after we've been through a trauma is we are like, okay, I need to make sense of this somehow. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So I might as well, again, I don't know if it's totally consciously, but it's like, I'd rather be the source of the blame than have to do right. with a world that's so out of control and scary or right. And, right. That's, and that's kind of how you move on. We, we saw the, the irrational kind of behavior, even during COVID when that was mm-hmm. happening, yeah. the rush to kind of figure out why this is happening yep. and to ruminate on why it happened. And then that results in urges and behaviors. So clearly mm-hmm. when you have a pandemic, mm-hmm. you have to rush and buy all the toilet paper and paper <laughs> towels that yes. exist. Yes. Right. I mean, no, so look true. at it's how, so fascinating in hindsight, isn't it? Yeah, yeah. I mean that what did that really accomplish for us? Mm-hmm. But I think it gave people a sense of control. Like I can do this. Right. Yep. I'm gonna do this. And yep. it really wasn't effective. And it wasn't effective for me, Mm-mm. but it also I think illustrated how on a systemic level it right. wasn't effective for our culture. Right. Because you're going to the store and there's no paper towels, there's yep. no toilet paper. Yeah. And exactly. so it, I think all of that really highlights the extent we go to mm-hmm. try to maintain control, find a solution yes. for all those what if scenarios mm-hmm. about the future and all those woulda, coulda, shouldas about the yeah. past. Yep. Yep. So 
it makes sense. It does. Yeah, we're not trying to be critical. We can laugh. <laughs> yeah. Because it is, you know, it's healthy to laugh mm-hmm. and even laugh at ourselves. Like, oh, yeah, look what we do. Yep, yep. And it's not effective. Right, right, exactly. I try to think of it as, um, I don't know what, what kind of school of thought this might be from. Maybe you'll know. But I kind of try to, like, think about when I get frustrated that I'm ruminating on something is, like, I think my brain is just trying to help me out here. Like, if I notice that I'm doing it or if I feel really stuck on something, I almost kind of take, I, I try to take a step back and be like, all right, my brain's doing me, trying to do me a solid right now. <laughs> like, I like that, yeah. Trying to help me out, trying to, like, point to something, and I don't have to feel bad that I'm ruminating, but I can also decide to kind of maybe shift my shift my focus to something else, mm-hmm. right? So, in, it, some of it's just pure habit, right? Like, yeah. And a lot of people report, I don't know if your clients report this too, but a lot of people have reported to me. It happens when they're trying to fall asleep. It's like, you know, that they'll ruminate about either the events of the day or about a week ago or a year ago or whatever. And it's like our brain just needs something to do, right? And something to quote unquote chew on, right? Right. So sometimes I think um, just catching those moments of like, okay, (laughs) could I try maybe a meditation or could I try maybe listening to music or could I try some of these other things, right? That's such a good point. And it's, it's at night when we actually finally stop yes exactly i hadn't thought of it but that's exactly right yep. right we stop we and slow down <laughs> the, yeah the brain really goes there yes and we again we are going to deal with that by trying to control it mm-hmm. and so we spend all this time ruminating or worrying because we're thinking we're controlling so for instance it, it can feel irresponsible to not ruminate. Oh, my goodness, yes. Nor to worry. So if my kiddo comes, mm-hmm. you know, when they're in high school and they said, I'm going to be in at 11. Mm-hmm. Like, yeah, that's right. I want you in at 11. Mm-hmm. And it's 11, 15, 11, 30, 12 o'clock, 12, 30. They're not here. Their phones, I can't get a hold of them. Now I'm worrying because mm-hmm. I have all these what if scenarios going on. Totally. And it would feel incredibly irresponsible just to sit down and start watching TV. <laughs> so what right. do I do? I'm going yes. to pace. Yes. And I'm going to keep looking out the window. Right. And I'm going to keep checking my phone, right. even though you're I a would good know father. if you call. Right. That's what a good dad does. And it gives this illusion that I'm doing something. And that it would so feel true. so irresponsible mm-hmm. to just sit and watch TV mm-hmm. and give up. I was going to say give up control. But... I'm not really giving up something no, I don't have. You never had it, but right. it's that illusion. It's the illusion I'm yes. giving up. And we hold on to that. That's so important. Oh my gosh, that is so true. That is so true. So I think people can relate. Yep. If they're a human being, there yep. you know, if there's some AI listeners out there, some artificial, <laughs> they may not be able to relate, but everybody else can relate to this. Yes. That's what I love about this. We're yep. we're trying to make therapy approachable that yep. this is normal we all struggle with it absolutely and absolutely. what's normal and and, and is that we struggle with it helpful to talk about it and, and get some help so what can we do if yeah. we're ruminating if we are worrying what mm-hmm. can we do so i had a couple thoughts on that one of the things that i don't again i probably can't take credit for this idea but um i learned it at some point is i've kind of given clients an assignment. And I've tried it myself. It's kind of funny, actually, where you say, okay, if there's a certain topic that you tend to ruminate about or a certain area of your life, I say, set five, 10 minutes aside a day and ruminate as hard as you can. (laughs) That's so good. It sounds kind of, you know, silly, but that's kind of the point is it's like, Give your brain five, ten minutes to just go to town. You know, just ruminate and you know, set your watch. Set your, set your exactly, your clock literally, and, set a right. timer. Yeah, and people, you know, I've had people give that a try, and they find, you know, I don't even need the whole. I get sick of it. Like I, try, <laughs> I can't even get right. to the full ten minutes because it's like this is not helpful. I don't really enjoy this. But once you're given your brain a chance and like this was your mm. chance, then the rest of the day you're kind of free and clear. It's like I did my time. Right. And I remember like you and I both do EMDR yes. therapy. Yes. And we talked about that. You talked uh, very well about EMDR. Mm-hmm. And one of the things we do to help people to, we call it resourcing in EMDR, yes. is is we do some visualization. Yep. And we talk, we call it the container exercise. And oh, you're, nice. you're doing some visualization, put everything in this kind of container you construct. Yes. And then you say to yourself, okay, 
you, cl you close it, you lock it, and you tell yourself, okay, everything's contained that I'm worried about, that I'm ruminating about. Yep. And then you promise your brain, mm -hmm. I'll come back to this yes. when I'm ready. There you go. And so we are compartmentalizing it to yep. a degree, but giving ourselves also yep. some time and some space, like you were saying, right. to engage in this. Right. Exactly. And that goes back to what you said earlier about we kind of feel like we're supposed to ruminate sometimes, like it's the responsible thing to mm -hmm. do. And so this is another uh, way to like you're doing what you're doing your time. You know, you're like, <laughs> I'm doing my five, 10 minutes of rumination. So now I have I've done the responsible thing. Yes. <laughs> and now I'm just going to let it go because I already I already kind of worked on this. Right. It yeah. feels responsible. It does feel responsible. <laughs> right. Instead of because people, I think, are afraid like, oh, I'm, I'm running for my problems or I'm ignoring my problems or and it's like, no, you're, you're not ignoring them. You're just giving yourself a time and a space to do it. Right. And then walk away. Yes. And yeah. there was a, a gentleman, I think his name was Louis or Louis Burkhoff. Mm -hmm. And he actually did some experimentation and some study and, and yeah. research on this and found it was highly effective when people would do exactly what you're talking okay, about. They, okay. I knew it was right. someone else. That came right. Yeah, yeah. And he prescribed like 30 minutes a day nice. just to worry. Love it. And then when the timer goes off, you're like, oh, I guess I'm done. Yeah. And then when you worry that next time or you start to ruminate mm -hmm. uh, an hour later, you think, oh, I've got an appointment mm -hmm. tomorrow at eight in the morning to eight 30 where I can do this. Exactly. Exactly. I'll oh. just I'll just put it off to the next time. Yeah. yeah. Scheduling exactly. it. That gives me Scheduling a sense it. of control anytime I can yep. schedule anything. Yep. Exactly. So what else can we do? So another thing I came across that I was interested in, I came across something called co-rumination, which I was like, okay, what the heck is that? But basically this is where you might be rehashing a situation with people you know or friends or like, and you're kind of, it's like you're <laughs> together, you're kind of ruminating about a situation, but that might not always be productive. So I thought that was interesting. So to kind of go back to your question of what to do about rumination, if you find yourself always talking about a certain situation with friends or, you know, yeah, obviously talk to your therapist about it, but if you're just kind of rehashing things and like, oh, you know, the situation and I'm so mad and resentful, that's not going to help you. So I would say just kind of watch what you're talking about. Mm -hmm. Not that you can't talk about your issues and problems, of course, with friends and family, but I think you, do you know what I mean? Like where it's like, this is beyond the point of productive. We always have, we've rehashed this four different ways and four different times. Right. Right. Yeah. And you know, that brings up an excellent point. I wish we had time to talk about today, but yeah. what if you're dealing with somebody who's Ooh, yeah. ruminating, yep. it's your friend or if it's your spouse or yes. your kiddo or whatever, yes. Right. how do we help them? And so just a sidebar, yeah. I think is if, if you have somebody, if you're listening and you have somebody in your life that constantly talking about things they're ruminating about in the past or mm -hmm. they're worried about in the future mm -hmm. and you're getting a little bit drained by it because you've been yeah. over it the umpteenth time this is what you can do is you can just say you always lead with validation nice. hey that's a great idea lead with validation we just talked about that yes. a couple weeks ago Love it. like hey it makes sense that you're worried about this or it makes mm -hmm. sense that you know you feel vulnerable so you lead yep. with validation and yep. oh, you just take a breath and then you say so what do you think you want to do about that Nice. Instead nice. of trying, because a lot of times we're so like tired of dealing with it mm -hmm. that we're like, well, just do this. <laughs> yes, now we're in the with the unsolicited advice. <laughs> right. Yeah, and because we're tired of it. Yeah. But I, I love that question. What are you going to do about that? What do you think you can do about that? Definitely. Well, I don't know. I don't know what to do. Yeah, it makes sense that you don't know what to do. And what do you think mm -hmm. you want mm -hmm. to do about what it? What could you, like, what are some ideas? Right. Yeah. Because totally. it highlights, I think, for the person, mm -hmm. there isn't anything I can do. And you just mm -hmm. sort of shake your head and, like, you are now. <laughs> like, <laughs> like, uh huh. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You, there is nothing you can do. <laughs> yep. So, what are you going to do about that? Exactly. exactly. So, anyway, a little commercial break on what you do <laughs> with somebody who oh, that's is great. really struggling. Bonus with material. This. Bonus material. Yes. <laughs> so, what else can we do if we're ruminating, if we're worrying? Yeah. Uh, I think this, um, I use this a lot in therapy and I use this a lot on myself when mm -hmm. I'm just finding myself resistant mm -hmm. to accept reality. We did a podcast uh, with Karen, Dr. Ryan, uh, in the past on radical acceptance. I love it. And when we're struggling to accept something that is out of our control, which is what happens when we're worrying and we're ruminating, Yes. we, we can ask ourselves... Mm -hmm. What's the benefit of continually worrying? Right. What's the benefit of continually 
ruminating. I'm doing this for some reason. So what's the benefit I get out of it? Because there's always utility in our behavior. And we can flip that a little bit. Same question essentially is ask, what's the threat? Yeah. What's the threat of stopping this? What's the threat of giving up yeah. and accepting? I don't have an answer. I'll never come up with an answer. There's nothing I can do. Yep. Why is that a threat to me? Totally. I like to ask that. I think it, it sort of, again, confronts us with yep. this reality yep. that I don't like, but I need to accept that mm -hmm. I can't control this. Yep. No, I love that. And actually, that made me think of one more quick thing. Yeah. Um, kind of, I mean, this is stealing too from just that mindfulness. Again, watching the thoughts. So I think people have a tendency, any thought they're having, they identify as like, this is me, <laughs> right? Yeah. Like these thoughts, these Ooh, are that's so good. my thoughts. Right. I'm, you know, they think that dialogue that we're always hearing in our head is my own voice, but oftentimes thoughts are impersonal. They're just kind of happening of their own. Mm -hmm. They're out there. They're, it's a tape that's playing. It's like, it's not me. So I can observe this thing that's mm -hmm. not me. So I think just that one step of detachment from our thoughts, we can just observe them. Be like, wow, the thoughts I'm I'm having, you know, are really, really seem to be focusing on that situation from last week. Huh. Right. I'm so glad you brought that up because there's so much shame attached to that all or nothing thinking about ourselves. That, yep. Well, I'm obviously a very anxious person. I'm anxious. <laughs> yes. And no, you're, That's, yeah. you are dealing with some anxiety yep. right now yep. but that doesn't define it's not your identity own. right yep. yeah so that's good to remember i also think of this kind of a, a closing illustration uh, i think of worry and ruminating mm -hmm. coming at us kind of like if you go to someone's house and they have a dog that's a bit out of control yes. uh, you know what that's like <laughs> it's gonna like jump up and try to look right your face. Yeah. yeah and i love dogs Me too. oh i love dogs and and i have a strong urge to engage them you know, I want to hug them. I want to scratch their ears and I, oh. you know, kisses. I love it. Good call. So I have such an urge. And they come with all this emotion. Mm. And so I know, like, all right, I probably shouldn't be doing this. So I should on myself. Because <laughs> yes, right? right. I know the owners don't want me to reinforce this. Yeah, behavior. they're like, don't let them jump off. So, the yeah. so what do they do? You know, they come in, the dog's jumping up on me. Yeah. And they're going to say, Sparky, get down. Sparky, Sparky, stop it, stop it, stop it. You know, and so they're adding all this energy oh, to the energy it. of the dog. Yep, yep. Yeah. And so the dog's feeding off that. Or So the dog can feed off the energy from the owners or if I'm engaging it. Yes. Now, dogs are not stupid. Right. Um, yes. So... What we can do is when a dog comes at us like that, all that energy, yeah, we acknowledge that it's there. We can look at it. Oh, yeah, the dog really wants to interact. And just mm. so we're not in denial about it. Exactly. But then we just pivot mm. a half turn away from it. Nice. Now, the dog, especially depending on how strong its personality is, will likely come around in front and beg for attention again. And yes. we just sort of acknowledge it. Oh, yep, it's there. I'm just going to pivot away. Yep. And you keep pivoting away and focusing mm -hmm. on something else. Yep. And the dog doesn't take long. The dog is like, oh, okay, this isn't working. And it stops. <laughs> now, the analogy is that worry and rumination come at us very much the same way the dog does. That's full so of this energy begging for attention. Yes. And we feel like it's responsible. Yep. To engage it. Yep. And if we can continually pivot away yes. and, and just normalize, of course it's coming towards me. Of course the worry's coming toward me. And yep. it makes sense that I want to ruminate again. Yep. 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 Makes sense. And then we pivot away. Right. And we just keep pivoting away. Yep. And as we pivot away and focus on other things, which we can do, it will go away. Yes. Just like so the dog true. does. And that is all evidence. How's this for teeing it up? <laughs> Of neuroplasticity yes. that we're going to be talking about next time. That we actually Ooh, can yes. change yep. Yep. because our brain is malleable and changeable. And so maybe we can end with that. That Love this it. is something you can change. And seeking out a therapist, yep. absolutely. Yep. I highly recommend that. <laughs> but you know, working on it, there is hope. Yes. And it's normal. And we'll tune in next time. So yes, we can, I can't wait. Yeah, I can't wait too. You're you're going to be telling me. I hope more there's more about dog it. stories. Uh, I'll do my best. <laughs> All right, good. All right, thanks again for joining us. We'll look forward to seeing you next time when we talk about neuroplasticity. 
Thank you as always for listening and please be sure to leave us a review. While this podcast can't be a replacement for therapy, we hope you enjoyed our discussion today and join us again next time. Nice German Associates is always available to those who are struggling. If you find yourself in need of support and help, please check us out at nystromcounseling.com.